So I'm talking to Frederick Christian, the crown prince of Denmark, and he asks, Hey Jeffy, how are you using cloud storage in your music production workflow? In this video, I provide perspective on how to use cloud storage if you're a musician, producer, or recording engineer. There are lots of other videos that compare various cloud storage providers, but very few describe what strategies make the most practical sense. When I say the leading cloud vendors, <clears throat> I'm referring to consumer-focused cloud storage, file sharing, collaboration, plus security and backup. This includes Microsoft OneDrive, Google Drive, Apple iCloud, Dropbox, Amazon Drive, iDrive, Box, One Backup, SugarSync, IceDrive, Sync.com, and pCloud. I'm not reviewing the features of each of these, but suffice to say that the most popular ones are somewhat aligned with your operating system preference. If you're a committed Windows Office 365 users, Microsoft OneDrive might be the most might make the most sense. If you've bought into the Apple apps and devices, iCloud might be worth a look. And if you work with the Google ecosystem across all platforms, Google Drive deserves some consideration. A lot of the other vendors are what I call vendor agnostic or operating system agnostic. They often compete purely on their often superior capabilities across all operating systems. They might have better pricing or a unique standout feature like encryption, file folder recovery for up to a one year. They might offer a lifetime plan where you pay only once, whereas most cloud services are monthly or annual subscriptions. Why listen to me? Well, I'm a music and video creator, so it's important that you understand where I'm coming from. I replaced an old second gen iPad with a new iPad Pro in 2020, and I started using iOS apps for music production. I've been a long time iPhone user, and all my studio work has been done on a MacBook Pro using Logic and other macOS software. Like a lot of us, I stored all my projects, samples, virtual instruments, plugins, and music assets on either the local hard drive on my MacBook or on portable hard drives to save space. As I got started with the iPad, I quickly realized that I needed access to all those assets on more than one platform, so I thought about storing them on the cloud. I thought it was a good idea. That way, I could start a composition on my iPad with, say, Blocks Wave or Beatmaker 3 or GarageBand, save it to the cloud, and then later grab it on my MacBook to finish it off on Logic Pro. I already had a Dropbox account with two terabytes of storage, and I had free space from Google, Amazon, and OneDrive. I also have an iCloud account, and I'd become familiar with the integration between Apple's productivity apps like Calendar, Reminders, Notes, and Photos. My plan was to fully commit to storing all of my project work and music assets on the cloud so they'd be readily accessible regardless of whether I was creating a new song on my MacBook or on my iPad. It sounded like a future utopia and I could avoid buying another USB hard drive every couple of years. Well, there's a big gap between that promised utopia and reality. The first setback is probably quite obvious, and that's the speed of moving large files across the internet. I was willing to be patient to download assets like sample libraries for a given project and to keep my master copies on the cloud. But that required planning in advance because I'm not always connected to the internet via Wi-Fi and high speed. I knew from the start that I'd have to manage my cell phone data plan carefully. Otherwise, I'd experience huge cell phone bills. It is true that the internet is ubiquitous, and now with 5G you can download files very quickly. But you're still managing data throughput, and depending on your cell phone plan, you may have a limit on how much data you can use at 5G speeds. Also, upload speeds are always 1 100th the speed of downloading, and to interact I need both. We don't think about it, but it seems the web is designed for consuming content, streaming, and downloading, not for creating content and uploading. Another reason uploading can be slow is that most of these cloud vendors offer encryption 
and compression on the way into their server. That means there's processing going on during the upload server side, and that 10 gigabyte file might only occupy one gigabyte after it's compressed. During busy periods, I've heard the servers can get bogged down. Prior to this notion of storing all my music assets on the cloud, I was using Dropbox to share projects and collaborate with other musicians. Dropbox was just a temporary transfer area. I would upload a bunch of projects and the assets go along with them, while my collaborator downloads the same assets to their local hard drive in their studio or at their home. The persistence of Dropbox data really didn't matter because it only had a temporary role in my workflow. When I would complete a music or video project, I would group together all the assets, put them in a folder, and store an archive copy back to Dropbox for future reference, almost like a backup. It would also free up space on my local hard drive to make room for current projects. But this idea of interacting with the cloud storage every day for all of your music and video work, that was a new thing. Here are a couple things I found out. Number one, iCloud and Dropbox work by storing a local version of your cloud drive on your MacBook by default. It takes up space, just the opposite of what you expect. Both cloud services have features to optimize the storage on your local hard drive or minimize the size of that local cloud structure to save space. But turning on optimize can have strange results. When you turn on these features to optimize or minimize storage on your local hard drive, you're letting iCloud or Dropbox make the decisions on where to store your most frequently used files based on their algorithm. It's kind of like handing over the keys of your car to a driver. Here's an example. You just downloaded 50 gigabytes of free sample packs and you only have 75 gigs of space remaining on your hard drive, so you drag those 50 gigabytes to your cloud drive expecting to free up the space. Since the creation dates of those files are today, or say within a week, iCloud believes those are frequently used files and to optimize your use, it immediately downloads those files to your local hard drive again. Then, after the iCloud sync is complete, you delete the 50 gigabytes, but now they reside in your trash can and in your local iCloud drive, occupying a total of 100 gigabytes. This isn't what I wanted. I want to use cloud storage just like a portable hard drive. To do that, you need to disable optimization features in Dropbox or iCloud. And one additional step is to right click on the properties of the cloud drive folder and remove it from the download option. By doing this, you prevent recently used files from being downloaded back to your local hard drive. Number two, it doesn't make sense to have multiple cloud providers because it can get very confusing if you can't remember which service you used when you last stored files on the cloud. Sure, it makes sense to take advantage of free storage on the cloud, but if you're gonna pay a subscription, I recommend choosing one primary cloud service provider. I'd rather have four terabytes of cloud storage with one provider than two terabytes of cloud storage spread between different providers. And I have no problem getting a deal and playing one service against the other to get the best possible price on your subscription. That's just common sense. Number three, subscription costs can change. I've noticed a lot of people are reluctant to sign a subscription for cloud storage because they're skeptical about the value proposition. I guess we like the idea of buying something and owning it, as opposed to rent that you pay every year or every month. Good cloud service providers are not inexpensive, and it's not unusual to pay $100 per year for one to two terabytes. With the cost of portable hard drives and SSD drives dropping, you could buy a new drive every year for the same money. So the cloud option has to provide more than just basic storage. There should be utilities and apps that address specific issues like sharing all your photos with your family members, which is easy to do on the cloud, but nearly impossible to do on portable storage. Yeah, yeah, I know. You can set up a NAS with a dedicated IP, but then that device has to be on all the time and you have to manage security. 
I think the technical requirements for network access systems is beyond your typical consumer. I initially had a good deal from Dropbox until last year when they increased their price by exactly double. In response, I switched my Dropbox account to the free version with only two gigabytes of space. For now, I'm focusing my attention on iCloud from Apple because iCloud can be bundled with Apple Music, Apple TV, fitness, news, and other services. Microsoft does the same by including OneDrive with an Office 365 subscription. Number four, what will you do when you don't have internet access? I have gigabit internet speed in my home recording studio, and it is great. But I don't do all my creative work in the studio. I'm often in different locations for inspiration, and I still need access to all my music assets. For that reason, I bought a one terabyte SSD portable drive with very fast data transfer rates. It's small and easy to pack, and with USB-C, I can connect it to my MacBook or my iPad or even my iPhone. Number five, do major cloud storage providers back up your data? The quick answer is no. A few offer a 30-day recovery if you accidentally delete a folder or file on the cloud. If you don't notice a missing file before the 30 days, you're out of luck. Unless you've been doing local backups to an external hard drive. Sounds old school, huh? You can get full backup services from the major cloud providers, but it's more expensive and usually part of a business plan, not the typical consumer plan. That said, there haven't been a lot of reports or complaints of data loss from the major cloud providers. In some ways, their record of security is better than the failure rate of portable USB drives and other storage options you might have at home. Here's a test. Find the oldest USB portable hard drive you own and try to connect it to a newer iPad. Chances are it doesn't work. Maybe an incompatible format or if you're using Mac OS Time Machine, it might not be readable at all. With those five points in mind, it begs the question, what role does cloud storage play in the life of a musician or recording artist? I think we're back to where I started. Cloud storage is most effective for sharing data and collaborating with others, but as a replacement for local storage, we're just not there yet. I was hoping to tell you to save money on your next laptop, tablet, or smartphone by buying just the minimum local storage and switch to using the cloud. For mobile devices, this might be sage advice. But for your primary computing device, it still seems you need two terabytes or more if you're producing music and videos. As a group, musicians and producers are usually fairly tech savvy, but most cloud services are dumbed down for the average consumer. We need something controllable, flexible, and powerful, but we don't want to pay the business level subscription. We're somewhere in between. Oh, one more tip. I had roughly 1.5 terabytes of data on Dropbox when I downgraded to the free two gigabyte plan. I didn't delete anything and my data is still there. I can't upload anything new, but I can download anything that was already there. And I'm not sure how long it will remain. I kept my account active, just downgraded the billing plan. I'm not sure if there's some legal requirement to keep all my data for a certain period of time. Please feel free to comment on your experience with cloud service providers and ideas on how to use the cloud in your own music or video career. Why am I wearing glasses?